Greetings and salutations. Welcome to another episode of The Legal Beagle. Today we're talking with Brett Fountain of Texas, and he has composed a master list of what you need to do if you get a citation and you're planning to fight it in court. He, he goes through the steps one by one of what you need to do, what you need to gather, where you need to go, and he is a master researcher, and he has been through the thick and thin of this all the way up to the Fifth Circuit of Court of Appeals with his cases, and so he is going to go through step by step. Now, he's unwilling to appear on camera today, so for his part, it will be blank, but I'll be there asking my questions, and I'm going to go ahead and apologize up front for my microphone quality. It was terrible. I've done as much editing as I can, so it might be a little bit choppy and I'm a little bit hard to hear, but um, we have a new microphone, so that will be remedied moving forward. So thank you for bearing with us on this one, but without further ado, here's Brett. Welcome, Brett. How are you? Hey, Gary. I'm doing well. Good to talk with you today. Likewise. I'm glad to be here. Glad you're here, even if it is without a picture. <laughs> right. One of these days I might get a camera. How did you figure all this out? Right. Can you tell us that? Sure. Uh, let's see. Background. I think we'd have to we'd have to go back to when I was something like 14 years old and my father was watching some Barristers in videos. They were ridiculous, but I didn't realize it at the time. These guys would go and they made in their videos, they described how they they would set up the law enforcement and, and set up the system when they really weren't doing anything wrong, but they would, I don't know, make it look like they had been deer hunting out of season. And, you know, they got one of these antlers on a on a plaque and they got some some blood from ground beef and they just made a little mess and, and it looks like they've been deer hunting put a piece of canvas over all of it and and come out of an area where they were supposed to not be hunting deer and and all of that was kind of the beginning it was really ridiculous and i guess about a couple of years later when uh, i was working for a city at the time <laughs> of all things doing IT work for them and I got my first ticket my it was from uh, a police officer who worked for the city the same city that I worked for and I had even been doing you know I worked IT so I set them up with their first MDTs mobile data terminals in their cop cars and you know I was working with the the radio systems and it was pretty fun. I was, you know, just a computer guy. I wasn't really caring anything about the law. I didn't know to care about it until I got wrongfully accused of speeding. Now, I will say I have done a lot of speeding in my time, but that was not one of them. <laughs> so that my, my first ticket there wasn't right. I pulled out of one parking lot out onto the street and pulled back into the next parking lot because I had, uh, gone into a place where I apparently couldn't cross over the parking lots didn't connect and I didn't realize so I came out onto the street and just was on the street for you know whatever 100 feet turned back into the next driveway and I got so uh, attacked by this officer he was furious and he was saying how badly I was speeding and he was really upset with me and I just was flabbergasted why am I being treated like this this is not right I mean, even if I had been speeding, you could show a little respect here and just, you know, be nice. What is this? This is so wrong. And I figured, well, I, I was so undone by that, uh, you know, destruction of my, my imagination. All of this about protecting and serving just went out the window. And I was so undone that I decided, well, I'm going to... Uh, but do that whole thing about the courtroom and the judge or he'll fix it. Right. Oh uh, yeah. You can take these things to court. You don't have to just pay it. So <laughs> again, I was so naive. I thought that if I just go into court and I you know, have the facts and the law on my side that, well, I'm going to win. Of course I won't have to pay. Well, the judge 
said the officer was telling the truth. And I, he asked me, are you calling this officer a liar? <laughs> mm. Now, if and he had asked me that, there. yeah, today, if he asks me something like that, I'll just answer him honestly. Yes. You know, I was just a 16 year old kid yeah. and I felt intimidated by the idea of calling this fine officer in blue here look at his fancy uniform and i'm going to call him a liar i said well your honor i i don't know what to tell you about him i'm telling you the truth and his testimony is opposite so you do that with that what you will so he did what he will he called me guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of all the essential elements even though there was none pled and he banged his gavel and asked me for however much money they wanted. And I said, well, your honor, I would like to appeal. I had no idea what that meant or how to make it happen. I knew the word. And so I told him that's what I want to do. And, and I asked him, what do I need to do to appeal? And he said, oh, just go over there and talk to that bailiff right over there. He'll help you out. Okay. Thank you, your honor. And I went over there to talk to the bailiff and bailiff says, come with me. I followed him. I thought he was going to take me around to somewhere to some, you know, go get a form to fill out something or other. I didn't really know what to expect. So I followed him, went down the hall, out the back door, across the parking lot into some other building. And this was the back of the jail building. I didn't think anything of it. I thought that, you know, I've been in there a hundred times with helping them with their IT stuff. So it didn't really freak me out to be going into the back door of the jail. And then he started booking me into jail for what I still don't know, but <laughs> that was the beginning of my uh, learning experience. When something happens that just goes so far against what your gut knows is correct, then you're motivated. You have some incentive to start figuring out what is correct and what are the rules that these guys are supposed to be following and what are my remedies if they don't because obviously they're not something's off something's wrong this isn't working the way i know it should be i don't know exactly the details of how it should be working but i know this is not it so then you have some incentive that's for me that was my incentive to go and start learning and at first it was a very quiet secret embarrassing thing that I was dealing with like oh my gosh I got in trouble with the law now I have a record all that kind of stuff and I didn't want to talk about it or tell anybody that I got in trouble with the law so it was just my own quiet research and and then I had another incident happen that was also totally wrong well <laughs> everybody's got lots of these issues they 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 deal with but yeah i had just been over to some people's house that they were in need their family was out of money and i had some money so i i took it over to them and we sat and talked and they were so happy and they were crying and you know uh, we had dinner together at their house and then when i left it was pretty late i for me i'm i'm what you know 19 years old or something and i I don't care about late. Late is fine with me. I'm, I'm not, I didn't know yet. At the time, I hadn't realized that cops who are out watching the streets at night have a higher suspicion of everything that happens and they treat everybody badly in the middle of the night. I didn't notice that until I started seeing a pattern emerge. So this was my first uh, experience in that pattern. Uh, yeah, it was, it was, I don't know, 1.30 in the morning or something. And I'm sitting in the middle of nowhere at a red light, waiting for the red light to turn green. And I had, and then an officer who, uh, he was in a parking lot. Uh, I guess it was a gas station. I can't remember. And he was in a parking lot there. And as he pulled around, my light turned green and I started going. And he went through his own red light to turn left and chase me. And the accusation that later came out was that I had gone through a red light. 
but it, we didn't get to that part for a very long time. I didn't even know for the longest time what he was going to come up with that I would be accused of. Uh, and so by the time I got up to a place that I could pull over, the road had all these little uh, orange cones and things for construction. By the time I got to where I could pull over, there were four officers cars converging on me and before i could get my seatbelt off i had a glock pointed at my head like an inch away from my temple wow. i was so uh, shaking i was disturbed with the whole attack mode like what are they doing why who do they think I've, they got the wrong guy i'm i'm just i'm the nice guy don't you even know i was over here just giving some people some money i'm like not not the guy you're chasing I don't know what you're doing, but it's not me. I was very disturbed and, and I got mistreated that night. But coming out of it, um, I told my dad, who at the time was working for the county. He was doing some programming for the county. Of all places, he was writing their court docket system. And so he had access to the database or, or he was work, he was designing the database. So he had access to the data that was coming in and he started poking around and seeing, wow, this actually kind of, this happens a lot. Wow, that city is really worse than the others. Wow, interesting. And I didn't, you know, I didn't know anything about that. Today, my goodness, if my dad still worked there and still had access to that thing, I'd have criminal complaints every day. <laughs> yep, I have reason to believe and I do believe this officer did that and the other, well. Anyway, that's 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 kind of the beginning of how all of that started. If my microphone was so terrible at the moment, I would I would tell you a little more of a story, but I'll save it for another day. But that is what we see is revenue collectors spend more often in some cities than others, and it really is a result of the people and what they tolerate. Yeah, exactly. That's that's one big factor. Another factor is how the city has decided, like the city police chief or a sheriff deputy in some cases will will choose who he's going to have on his his team. You know, he his I, I don't know, I tend to call think of it in in the us versus them terms that they've pitched to us, but the the officers are often employed based on their either low IQ or their um, high tempers. If it's a raging bull, he's liable to get on the force. If he has no respect for anybody, he's gonna have it his way. He's the kind of person who will often be selected and, and, and put on the force. They don't choose people who are the protecting and serving type. So those two factors in combination, that and, and the are the people not knowing how to hold each, our officials accountable. That's that's a bad combination. Well, the, the Andy Griffith types don't don't produce revenue for the city. Sorry, say that again. The Andy Griffin type, Andy Griffith type don't produce revenue for the city. <laughs> exactly. Or as the Barney Fife's type do. <laughs> sure, Barney Fife. I guess I should have used that reference. Show him my show him my young age. Oh, we watch a lot of those reruns all the time. So I know for me, and it seems like for most of the people I run into, we don't really care about whatever's going on in that whole legal world until it lands on us. Something bad happens and we have the expectation that those, those lawyers are the professionals, they'll handle it. I mean, we have laws, right? Everything is going to go according to the way it should. And then we get really disappointed when we figure out, hey, they're not doing things right. I still have a problem. And whether that's, uh, whether that's via traffic stuff, it seems like the most common way for people to get kind of roped into the, the justice system. Uh, or sometimes it's the code enforcement. You have your, you know, your city sends people around to you know, grass police or things like that. And it seems like that might be the, the two most common ways I don't know what you tend to run into, but oh, I think that's I think America as a whole runs into the municipality a lot more than anyone else. 
Yep, exactly. Sometimes the and state, that, sometimes the feds, but mainly the Michigan. You can just balance. Right. And those those guys running around in um the, well, I I hesitate to lump everybody into peace officers because you know, some of them are doing different kinds of tasks, but the ones that work for the city are uh, that's the ones we commonly run into for traffic stuff, right? That's right. Like so, license plate or speeding or Yeah, or yeah. So of course at more advanced levels, like you know, you you're you're involved at some a lot higher levels in legal arenas here but a lot of people when they first start out they don't know anything and they're not trying to stir up trouble with anybody they just either they forgot that their something was expired or or for whatever reason a sticker is out or something and you know grandmother's sick i went to take care of her and came back and found a citation from the code enforcement saying my grass is too tall or all kinds of things like that and you get looped into having to deal with the, the city courts. Yeah, we've, we've already talked to Tate on here, so we've heard about the grass, talked to Jimmy Jones, so we know about the license plate, we know about the mask not getting in the court. It's just on and on and on. So I think <laughs> that's things great. you're talking about. There's a guy, Jerry, in Pennsylvania that you probably want to talk to about grass police, how he, he, he kicked their butts in the Fed. Send him my fun. way, I'd love to. <laughs> But yeah, let's just go over some some basic things that when people get in trouble with the law, so to speak, you know, the the law enforcement officers, they think they are the law and the prosecutors think they're the law and the judges think they're the law. And obviously they're not. The law is it's in black and white. It's written down. It's from our legislators. But uh, let's talk about what to do when you've you've been dragged into these quicksands of court against your will you got some kind of citation and you're you're going to have to show up and uh, as they call it appear and what does that even mean to appear but so one of them would be traffic tickets and one would be code enforcement and with either one of these you have to take a look and see first what is the nature and cause the nature of some kind of wrongdoing you've been accused of the nature is going to be like criminal is it a civil matter? Is it maybe it's a uh, an administrative thing because you're being accused of violating some code, some ordinance of a city, and so the the ways that you're going to be able to be responding to these issues are different depending on the nature and cause. So let's take traffic. Let's take uh, in most states they consider it as a criminal thing. So that's probably the first thing you want to try to figure out is in your state, you can even do this before there's an issue. Um, I think I made a note about that. Yeah, so Jimmy was telling us that when you go to municipal court, citation, they convert it to a criminal situation. And that's when he was able to do discovery and really nail them to the wall. Yes. And you absolutely do have discovery if, if, yeah. So if it's a civil, if it's a code enforcement issue, which I don't know what Jimmy's dealing with and what the state was in Texas, it's already criminal from the beginning. And in most states I've looked at, Florida doesn't. Florida starts out with, uh, they call it a civil infraction. there's a there's several others that do that. They start out, but then they say if you don't pay by a certain time, well now it's becoming criminal. Uh, and if you don't show up, they have a different reason why that becomes criminal. But in Texas, it starts out criminal. Hmm. They say these this particular wrongdoing that you're accused of doing now it's state versus you. That's a crime. Wow. So. I would say before, ideally, you could, these are some things I've put up here on the screen, some things that um, it's good to go ahead and know before you run into the situation. You can wait and do it later, but it's it's really helpful if you already know, and then you don't feel like you're under the gun when it's time to hurry up and figure out how to respond. Like, it's good to know, what is this? Your transportation, here we go. 
is this a civil or a criminal matter? When they say that you've violated something, something, you know, your, your license plate is um, unlit or the bulbs that light it are too dim. And <laughs> where are they um, dragging you in? Are they dragging you in as this is a crime? Or are they dragging you in as you violated the contractual agreement that you made? Because you handle it differently, right? Um, and, and so this is more general here. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, and so that, that was the issue here in the Fifth Circuit. Um, they didn't they didn't want to address the revenue agents that uh, took police power, tracked revenue from the inhabitants. They didn't want to address yeah. that. They kind of made fun of me. No, that's completely appropriate to bring up. I mean, they're they're out of line to do that. So if they're trying to apply something that's their own rules inside their own corporation and they're trying to apply that outside the corporation and impose it on the public as if it's binding law well they're they're essentially impersonating a legislative official they we've seen that with tate and the grass and, uh, yeah exactly they try to make their own quote-unquote laws but in fact it's just just like a rule that Taco Bell man. Exactly. We they say you're supposed to Taco wear a purple Bell. shirt. And if you don't wear a purple shirt, you're going to, you know, be in trouble. <laughs> you don't work for Taco Bell, so you don't have to do, follow those rules. Correct. Uh, so uh, here we have a couple of items that uh, it's good to go ahead and look up. And the reason I'm going to suggest you look these up everybody in their own state is to go ahead and know not only for defending yourself when ac accusations are made, but also for the unfortunate, um, uh, I wish I could say it's not necessary to hold everybody accountable, but unfortunately they're going to put themselves in a position where they really deserve a spanking. Uh, I'm sorry, but that's what they're going to do. And so be ready for that and don't let it mm, get under your skin like a sense of betrayal. Just go ahead and be a grown up about it and be aware that this is how they're going to act and recognize that you're going to have to give them a spanking. And so in order to, to do that, you need to know what does due process look like. And I'm specifically speaking to crimes. When a criminal complaint needs to be made, whether it's uh, an officer who is saying he's swearing such and such facts that lead up to an offense that you supposedly committed or whether it's you swearing out some facts that that you're saying this is the truth this is xyz facts which each one of these facts is going to relate to essential elements of a cause of action a criminal cause of action you're going to point out that this officer or that clerk or that judge or that prosecutor did X, Y, and Z in the absence of this and so forth. So you lay these facts out. And when you have a criminal complaint, where does that go? Take a look at what your local law says about who's a magistrate. Typically, it's going to be magistrates and grand juries who we the people are directed to, um, to give this notice of crime. Sometimes you'll find uh, Pennsylvania is a, a strange example about uh, what's different there. They, they handle theirs differently. But most states, you will find that you need to go to a grand jury or a magistrate. Magistrates are much easier to find. <laughs> grand juries are kind of uh, this little secret thing going on that it's you can get to them, but it's just not as easy. Magistrates, you can walk right into their office. Uh, so take a look at who your state says has a duty to act on your criminal complaints. You're going to need to do that. You'll you'll be in a situation, you're encountered by some wrongdoing. That the ones who are actually accusing you are doing much worse than they've accused you of doing. And they've skipped due process and they're causing trouble. And you need to know how to hold them accountable. So... So we're basically, uh, that's what I would say. We're basically going through some basic basics you need to know before, as you get a traffic citation or a code enforcement code enforcement 
citation. Yes. Okay. Yes. Ideally before, like start today when you don't have anything hanging over your head, there's no oppression. There's everything is just a sunny day and, and you just need to go ahead and prepare. So go ahead and look this up for your state. Go ahead and figure it out. How does this work in my state? Even though you don't need it yet, your familiarity with that will really help lower your stress on the day when you get surprised by some accusation. It is easy to confuse and conflate the issues. And I'll just speak to um, the need for people to separate and distinguish what's going on here. So you've been pulled over, you're going 45 and a 40, and and the officer's rude to you and says you were going 60 and a 40, and that's more than 20%, whatever. So then your, your natural inclination is to argue about that and say, I was only going 45, or whatever is the thing. You you want to push back on the, uh, the wrongful accusations, but you also have an issue here with he lit up his lights in the first place. He indicated there was an emergency. You moved over, and instead of him going by, he wants to come and talk to you about your paperwork. He wants to compel you to give evidence against yourself. He's got nothing, but he wants you to give him all this paperwork, and then he can check and see if your insurance is expired or if it goes to a different VIN number. Whoops, you put this one in the wrong car. Ha, <laughs> gotcha. All this stuff that he wants to figure out after the fact what, what he can ticket you for. That's not right. And you need to not just feel in your gut that it's not right, but be able to mentally distinguish this in each each of these mm, wrongdoings, shall we say, goes into its own category, into its own little channel. And you can deal with the one that's coming against you, destroy the case, eliminate the case, annihilate every uh, it, every count of of crime that they say, you know, you, you, they say that you did such and such. Oh, and also, like for example, the speeding. Oh, and you didn't have your your registration is out of date. Oh, and your insurance expired yesterday. Oh, I got the new one. It's just not in the car yet. Don't talk to them about that. Right. I mean, there's we've been taught to know or think that the police officer is has our best interest in mind. That is not the case. No. Unfortunately not. I mean, we want to be polite, but not chatty. Don't give him anything. Answer his questions with your own questions. You have to realize this law enforcement officer, okay, he has whatever he has. He doesn't need any evidence from you. Uh, but that's actually, that's actually a good thing because he has next to nothing. He wants evidence from you. And unfortunately, he's willing to harm you in a heartbeat. So you know, don't, don't refuse to give him ID. Don't refuse to give him whatever stuff because they're liable to just go off and, you know, they shoot people for the silliest reasons and then don't, just don't, don't mess with them. But instead, as you're, you're being polite and cooperative, make sure you ask things that lock in the law enforcement officer's position. You know, why did you pull me over? Was I suspected of some kind of crime? Go ahead and, and ask questions that make him articulate what's going on here. Oh, I pulled you over because I couldn't see your license plate very well. Okay, so now that's clear. Now we know what his original reason was, and he can't later fudge it to mean something else based on you know, some other evidence that he forced you, compelled you to give against yourself, like insurance was out or whatever other reason you've you've locked him into his position whatever he says his position is now he's going to have to deal with that right so he's building a case you're building a case and exactly. the less you give him the the better off you're going to be so <laughs> absolutely answer his question with an answer or just simply say i don't answer questions right um, now yes they have a gun and they're going to win the day but they won't win the war and so um I would, I would just say, be polite. If if he's open to talking about these freedom ideas, fine. 
but otherwise, at the gun, he's going to win the day. That's that's how I feel. About it. Exactly. And I've never met one. I've, I've met quite a few. I've never met any of them who are interested in hearing any new take on <laughs> the law, the behaviors that they're exerting, whether or not they have authority, whether or not these things apply to somebody who's not involved in the transportation. What is the regulated activity? Is it just moving around or is it just, is it commerce? They don't want to hear any of it. They're not interested. I've never found one to be interested. That's because they've been trained by the municipality. Yep. And it's a, it's a money game. I understand. But I guess early on, I had some kind of misconception. Um, I don't know, call it naivete. I, I really expected that these people are people and they're going to be more interested in doing things right than just bringing in money for their boss. Right. That doesn't seem to be the case. I don't find uh, any interest in you know, the person that they've pulled over is their victim. They see this as defendant. They see this as suspect, accused. They don't see this as teacher. They don't see this person as, I need to learn something from him. So just don't don't worry about it. Don't try. Or even citizen. <laughs> yeah, certainly not the person they're protecting. <laughs> the protect and serve, I don't know where that went. Out the window. But I did want to make a point here about recording. Make sure you record this interaction. You're going to go back over it later and you're going to notice some things that you didn't before, things that will help your case and things that will build your case against the wrongdoers who seized you at your liberty. And I say that phrase seized you at your liberty intentionally. This is, he didn't just pull you over. When the law enforcement officer hit his lights, he gave you the impression that if you were to just go ahead and mind your own affairs and and ignore him, you were going to be in trouble, maybe shot. So, yeah, he you know, forced it, you to the side of the road, right? And you don't get to continue about your business. So uh, he seized you at your liberty. He better have a really good lawful reason for doing that. And it doesn't. It, it's. If he wants to come and talk to me about my papers and find out if I've got something, something paperwork, or if I'm in, involved in a contract with the city, or if I'm, that doesn't count. I don't care how curious he is. That does not rise to the level of giving him authority to seize me at my liberty. So, so yeah, make sure you're recording these things. Uh, if possible, video, uh, not everybody has the, the equipment for that, but if if you could at least get audio, then then do that. Uh, because the, often these body cams and their recordings go missing. <laughs> they sure do. Very convenient. And that's typically that when the happen. when they recognize that they've done something wrong, either they didn't um, make their own case very well, or they actually did something wrong that would embarrass them or their agency. Yeah, those those cameras go missing. What a shame. So yeah, I would say, um, you know, don't try to teach them anything. Ask a few questions to try to get them locked into what it, what their position is. Record the whole thing, and just get it over with as quickly as possible. Take the ticket. Don't make a big deal out of it. You're going to deal with all of this paperwork in court. And so that's the next thing I would say is, um, is to go ahead and go to the court. Here I have just calling the court to find out about their uh, hours and the address, but go as quickly as you can. If you can do it that same day, great. If you don't have to be somewhere right then, turn around and go to the court that you'll have. He hands you this notice to appear or a promise of, to appear. And I would suggest going there. You want to go see the file. They're not going to have anything, but you want to go see the file. And typically, it's just going to be either empty or it'll be a digital copy of the citation that was issued. You're never going to find something that says uh, it's a primary pleadings. The primary pleadings are to, to commence a criminal case or an indictment or an information. And the information has to be based on a sworn complaint. 
Sorry, a citation is not going to cut it. Even a sworn complaint is not going to cut it. The sworn complaint has to accompany the primary pleadings. Look, if you if you start a civil case, you go, you walk into the courtroom and you bring a controversy to the court. You're saying, hey, I need to invoke the aid of this court to help me adjudicate an issue here. I'm the plaintiff. I'm bringing a complaint. And when you present that paperwork, whatever's on that paperwork is the subject matter. And if it matches with the court's statutorily conferred subject matter jurisdiction, then the court will have subject matter jurisdiction over that case, right? Well, well that's in theory. Yeah. And so here in a criminal case, the way for a court to be vested with this subject matter jurisdiction is by having some paperwork, primary pleadings, indictment or information, and on that paperwork, the subject matter that's indicated matches that court's statutorily conferred subject matter jurisdiction. So if there's no paperwork, <laughs> there's nothing. There is there is no case. I'm sorry. I know they want to pretend like there's a case. I mean, they've got a case number and everything, but they've got nothing to support that. There is no case. There's only the appearance of a case or the simulation of a case, I should probably say. Appearance is another special word that uh, typically means you show up, but you can also show up via paperwork. Uh, but yeah, they don't have a case. They're only acting like they have a case. Yeah, for, for far too long, we've sat back and just paid these minor fines. And it's such a hassle to go down. Yeah, exactly. That, that we've just been trained and lulled into a sense of enslavement of sense people. And well, they said they have right. a case. Well, if you don't do it, they're going to seize something and seize your liberty. And it's our own fault. Yep, I agree with you, Gary. It is. And, you know, not not maliciously or anything. It's not like we intended for this to happen. But by by being lax and not stepping up and figuring out what's going on, we've left ourselves open, essentially, for this. A fact. So, yeah. Uh, so you go in there to the court clerk. And people ask me all the time, well, can I just email them? Can I just call? I tried calling over there and she said that she didn't have anything. Try in another couple of weeks. No, don't call them. Don't email them. If you call, only call to just check and see what's their street address because you're, you're going there. Physically go there. And here's why. They're going to treat your, your request to, to look at the case as a records request if they can get away with that because a records request they have x number of days to respond you know five days 10 days 10 business days something that, that statutorily is is a maximum before they're officially considered criminals for not showing you those records and so they'll go right up to the line typically i'm sorry but <laughs> I probably sound jaded, but no, they don't. They they wait all the way till the last minute, usually, and then they'll tell you some kind of silly reason why, well, you didn't identify yourself well enough, so because of this, we can say that uh, you're not entitled to these records, or this contains confidential information, and whatever they're going to say it's a it relates to an ongoing criminal investigation so you're going to have to get it through discovery and even though there is no investigation there's no case there's no nothing but if there were a case that would be true you do need to get it through discovery but anyway go down when you physically go there they have no excuses there's no time you're standing there. You ask to see some records. They just pull it out. You say, I want to inspect the, the court, the, the file. And somebody so you're saying call it the file. Don't, don't give them the option to do it on their leisure. Go down there, demand it, see it, see them grab yeah. it and see it in front yeah. of them. And don't, don't give them an, an option to alter anything or delay. Just go and see it for yourself. In exactly. And the key word there is inspect. I'm here to inspect the records. Uh, in most states, that is a special key word that means I'm going to look at them for free. And they're not going to charge you by pretend you're a making, code enforcer. 
tell them, hey, I'm here to inspect. <laughs> I'm it's not inspect in the sense that that you're going to uh, see if their records are valid. It's not that kind of inspecting, but it is looking at the records as opposed to asking them to make you copies of the records. Now, sometimes if all they've got is electronic records and they can't turn their monitor around, they're behind this plexiglass screen, whatever. Okay, fine. So I don't care. Let them print it out and show it to me. You're not charging me for those, you know? Right. They want to charge per page for pretty much anything they can. But I didn't ask for copies. I just wanted to inspect. So that's free. It's always free. Like you said, these are our records. They work for us. Correct. So after she's pulled out the folder and set it up there on the counter, and you're looking at these records, you, I, I like to take a look and see how many are there. There's my, is it one page? Are we looking at four pages? What is this? And... You could even snap some shots with your screen, with your uh, cell phone if you want to. But you get that in you in front of you now. And once you're looking at it, then you, you smile, you thank her, you push it back over to her, and you ask her for a certified copy of it. Okay, now she doesn't have any excuses. She can't wait two weeks. She can't talk about how busy she is. You're right there. So you just stand there, you ask for a certified copy, and she's got to do it right now. There's no opportunity for any prosecutor or any other attorneys to get involved and try to decide if it's okay for you to look at these and whoops, there's, I got to cook the books first. There's nothing else. You're just right there and you're asking her to certify it. Very good point. So when you email, you are giving them a heads up to say, hey, somebody wants to take a look at one. You better hurry up and, and fudge and forge on this one first because he's already asking to see it. Don't give them that option. Don't even give them any heads up about anything. You just go in there. When you're inspecting, then you push it back, ask for certified copy. They'll probably charge you a few bucks for that, a dollar or two per page. But now you've got something that is as of this date and time, you can tell for sure there was no case. And it can't be altered by someone with a vested interest in the outcome of the case. <laughs> yeah, one would hope. Because <laughs> right. if, you, if they do. Yeah, if you get then... all the copies up on, date, on say, July 1st, July 5th, the prosecutor can't come say, well, we meant to add this or that. No, it wasn't there. Yeah, exactly. Right. So you put so... them in a box. Another reason that I say go there is you can just casually ask to see the magistrate while you're there. And they're always going to tell you, oh, magistrate's not available right now. Uh, the only thing we can do if you want to see the judge, you have to enter a plea. And uh, if you say not guilty, then we'll set a date and you get to see the judge. That's their typical response. You've just done something. And they don't normally notice this, but what you've just done by walking into that courtroom, uh, the courthouse, and asking to see the magistrate, you have fulfilled your promise to appear. Ah. Your citation said something about you need to go within 10 days, or it'll say honor before such and such a day. And you walked in there the same day you got that thing, and it says uh, you need to appear. Well, you did. You went in there magistrate wasn't there. There was nobody that was ready or willing to talk to you. In some cases, I've even had it, had them tell me that uh, the court's not available to the public today, and that's just something else that you get to ding them for. Now, this, this all begs the question, Brett. How many citations have you gotten? <laughs> oh, my goodness. I don't know. 20? I don't know. And we're, we're it's a long list tickets or other things. Oh yeah. Speeding, uh, all kinds of traffic stuff. I've had the registration thing. I've had the insurance thing. I've had the, uh, probably more speedings than anything else, but I've had several of the others. And, and at one point they, when I showed my driver's license, I used to have a Texas driver's license. And when I show that, uh, the officer tells me, oh, looks like that expired yesterday. And whoops, I didn't realize that. Guess what? They did a retroactive suspension on my license 
so that they could call that ticket driving without a license. Oh yeah, wow. it's suspended. <laughs> so yeah, that then things got really hairy from there. I had to deal with uh we used to have some legislation in Texas that allowed them to after they called you driving while license invalid, boy, they could do a lot of bad things to you. And it got uh there's a a law firm, it's about four hundred lawyers in the capital, Austin. And they were a debt collection firm. And they called themselves the Municipal Services Bureau. And wow, it was really a scam. You know, if lawyers can make something difficult to understand, it was it was their billing system. <laughs> they would send out letters that look like you need to throw it away because it's just garbage. And then they would say in there that you owe whatever, let's say it was $765. It was a driver's surcharge fee, but you can't pay it all right now. You have to pay it over the next three years. Right now you need to pay one third of it. And next year at this time, you can't pay early and you can't pay late, but this year, uh, next year at this time, you need to pay another third. They don't tell you that the next ones, when the next ones are going to be, they just (laughs) <laughs> they just say, this is what you owe right now. Then you have the next one's come. If you miss the second one, or if you get the first two and miss the third one, then they put a whole new layer of collection on there. So that'll be another $765 on top of the others that were being collected. And they don't reference anything. They just put these weird codes on there. So 76 GKB4 is the reason why we're billing you today. And it was such a crazy scam. I finally, uh, I, I won't say I was the only one. I'm sure other people were fighting it too, but uh, I got at some point uh, a sense of success when we saw that our governor abolished that. Oh, so it different. doesn't exist anymore in Texas. Some states still have that mess. You know, it's it's similar, obviously not exactly the same, but yeah, it was it was definitely a scam. Well, they they regularly change the DUI laws here in Louisiana, and they are now up to a point, I think it started this early January, that they can now put you in jail for six months. What are we doing here? Are we trying to take six away- Six months? Jobs? Yeah. Are we trying to take away jobs or livelihoods from everyone? Is that Because that's the effect, DUI. You absolutely are going to lose your job. You absolutely are going to lose- your livelihood and, and maybe your home and God knows what else. Yeah. Yeah. Most what people would lose their do? home, their cars, everything. Crazy. Absolutely. Yeah. Crazy. Wow. That goes, that goes to, uh, makes me think of bills of attainder. Absolutely. Where basically you, you lose everything and you're all your, your offspring from now on is just destroyed. Absolutely. Wow. I didn't, I didn't mean to interrupt your flow. Continue. No, that's cool. So I was just describing about how it's good to go to the court court clerk and a little bit about why it's good, because I get so many people that say, oh, man, that's 35 minutes away. I don't want to go over there again. Or if I go over there, they're just going to arrest me. No, no, no. Go over there. Go see the court clerk. Stop with all the scared stuff and just go do what you need to do. You need a copy of what's going on there. Otherwise, you don't have anything to talk to. You don't know what's going on. You need to look at the documents, and from there, you'll be able to say either A, there's no case, or B, oh, they do have some paperwork in in the record, and here's what it says, so I'm able to know the nature and cause of the accusation. Like some of these citations, whether it's from a, a municipal police officer or whether it's a municipal code enforcement um sometimes even county sheriff or a state trooper, these citations will say on there what specific, uh, they might not say the nature, they might say just the cause, like uh, section 521 point something, section 545.351. They'll they'll point you to something and is really helpful if you can, as early as possible, figure out what you're being accused of and go find it. Where is the language of that? So 
like this might be a, if it's a state crime or if it's a it's in the transportation code you know so it relates to the regulated activity of commercial transportation uh, if it's a municipal ordinance the way that you handle this like we were talking about earlier it's different depending on the nature and cause so it's great to go ahead as early as possible go get these documents and figure out what's against you what's what are you being accused of now obviously if it's a crime there's no case until there's some primary pleadings like i said they're going to act like there's one but my only thing i like to harp on right now is jurisdiction I've gotten so many wins for myself and other people by just harping on the fact that the court never acquired jurisdiction in the first place because there's no paperwork. And typically what happens is uh, the, the judge will say, well, didn't you get a copy of the citation? I've got a copy right here if you need one. He's wanting me to plead to something that has never been expressed. and he'll say it's been expressed just because the citation exists but it hasn't been expressed lawfully according to the due process of law the paperwork that would express that doesn't exist so all this little cryptic that would be an indictment from a grand jury or an information from a district attorney or county attorney yes based on a sworn complaint and attached to the sworn complaint so both would be filed together in the court record. The way that a court gets jurisdiction is not from a cop. I mean, these officers that pull you over, they do not represent the state. They can't go into a court, just like we were talking about earlier. If you're a plaintiff, you come to the court and you say, here's my complaint, count one, count two, count three, and I need this court to adjudicate these things. The cop is not doing that. He doesn't represent the state. He's a potential witness if the state comes after you, but the state hasn't come after you. And under due process, um, can the cop sign, sign the complaint? He can only... Yes, he can. He's doing that not in his uh, capacity as any kind of officer, but in his capacity as a man who's a witness. I saw such and such. I, this is what I saw. This is what I heard. It happened in my sight, my hearing, and here, here are the facts. It would take, for that to become a meaningful accusation in a court, the state needs to come against you. Now, obviously, the state doesn't really exist. It's just a fictional entity, but we have, we the people, via our legislatures, have set up a way for the state to be represented, and the state can come to court. And that's only via a lawfully authorized individual, which in Texas, it's only the district attorney or the county attorney. And some counties, there are a few counties, I think um, 33 counties out of the 254, there is uh, a third that's kind of a merged version. It's a, called a criminal district attorney. So let's just say there are three different people that it could be. A cop is not one of them, and neither is the city attorney. City attorney is nobody. If somebody sues the city, he can go in there and dance around and do his shenanigans in there and try to defend the city. Or if the city wants to sue somebody else, he can go in there and argue about the case. But he is nowhere in law is he authorized. The city attorney is not authorized to bring a case against you, not on behalf of the city and not on behalf of the state. If you want to do a criminal case, 50 states, or we're talking just Texas. I've never seen anywhere where it is authorized. But I guess it's possible that there's somewhere that allows it. But no, yeah, I guess that would go back to look at your local rules and figure out what does due process look like. But I, I can't see that that would be. It's possible for the legislature of any given state to say, this is how we want due process to work out and they could specifically authorize a city attorney to represent the state. I doubt that they would. These city attorneys are such punks. Uh, but the, the fact remains that only an authorized individual can bring a case against you, a criminal case. And the cop is not one of those. 
in any given county, uh, you're probably only looking at two people, maybe three, who could do that. And it's not any of the peace officers, sheriff, deputy, doesn't matter. They can't do that. They can't represent the state. I don't feel like that's so, been led to believe. Right. Well, we've also been led to believe that if they get all upset with you and you're not nice enough to them, then they get to put the cuffs on you and drag you off and put you behind bars. <laughs> Where did that idea come from? That's ridiculous. They're our overlords. They have two situations they can arrest, with warrant, without a warrant. If it's without a warrant, it better be an on-site offense that he sees that you committed some kind of crime. You, you just attacked this lady, you stole her purse, tried to run off, and, and so he saw it, saw it happening. Now he can arrest you without a warrant. Or, yes, a crime. Not witness a, one of the essential elements of a regulated activity violation. That has nothing to do with nothing. He doesn't even know how to rec recognize what activity is regulated. You get him in court on the stand and he's clueless. He doesn't know what's regulated. Why well, all motor vehicles, but he doesn't know what a motor vehicle is. He doesn't realize that it has to do only exclusively with commerce. He's clueless. So, you're so saying, sorry, say that again. So you're saying our cops have been trained well. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, that's uh that's an issue that needs to be. We need some improved training for sure for our officers and it puts them in a bad space too i mean if you think about it they, I'm, I'm sure there are some of them who are trying to do the right thing and they've got bad training they're working with a system where their bosses tell them to go out and do xyz when the law tells them they're not allowed to do that and they go do it and if you and i don't spank them for it then they're going to continue to revert to that bad training unbelievable yeah so there's no case. That's that's my main point. There's no case. You've got threatening looking paperwork, which in Texas is, is known as the crime of simulation of legal process. Simulation of legal process means you receive something written down and it looks like you're going to have to act in a certain way or refrain from acting in a certain way based on what's written in that document. And then, as you know, if they send that document to you in the mail, now they've looped in the U.S. Postal Service, and so it became a mail fraud, <laughs> the Title That's 18, nice. Section 1341. So they've, they've just escalated and amplified their own wrongdoing by simulating legal process and doing it, doing, having their fraud scheme carried out through the Postal Service. But like I said earlier, these are issues that you have to properly categorize. In your mind, you have to put that in its own little box. Deal with that separately. That will not get you off the hook when you're being accused of speeding. Instead, deal with the essential elements of, of the due process, the crime that you're accused of, or ideally, even better, highlight that there's no case and the court has nothing to adjudicate. Well, these are these are wonderful tips that I bet not very many people think about before they get a traffic. Yeah, who would want to? I told a judge one time, I, I said, look, I, I understand you guys are not following the law, and I understand it's embarrassing for me to walk in here and tell you things that your own attorneys and everybody didn't even know about. It's written in black and white. I get that it's embarrassing. I'm sorry about that. But honestly, it's your fault, because if you had known what it said, I wouldn't have had to invest any time looking into all this boring law stuff and then embarrassing all your people. He got right. kind of a chuckle out of that. You, you brought it upon yourself. <laughs> you know, it's it's true that it's on us. Like you said earlier, it's on us. But I was telling him that day as if it's on him because I had to get, I had to bother myself reading all of his boring law stuff. So what uh, what next? Any 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 other tips? Well, let's see. We talked about traffic stuff. We didn't really touch much on the code enforcement, a little bit about the the fact that these guys are writing laws that are not laws. They're acting like they're laws, but they're really just enforcing an ordinance. And, you're and ordinances are council? not laws. The city council? Yes. Okay. They go in their little mahogany room and they come up with some rules about how they want to get more money by doing this and this, and they only allow this kind of bush and only that kind of bush. And if you have an RV, then it shouldn't be visible from the street. They come up with all these rules and 
and then they attach dollars to those. Oh, if you violate this and that, then now we get to collect some of your money. These rules are, are not unconstitutional. And I think that's where people tend to get tripped up. We know in our gut, as soon as we hear this, or as soon as we see some little slip of paper on a door hanger, we say, oh, brother, that's not right. We know it's not right, but we tend to immediately categorize it as an unconstitutional. And technically, it's not. It's just being applied in an unconstitutional way. They can write ordinances. And in but fact, they their lawyers will. Lot. Yes. It's, it's being applied, but it's being misapplied. Exactly. Which becomes. Yes, in effect, yes. So they do have the authority through, we the people have given our legislatures the ability to authorize them to do certain things like write certain ordinances, but then they turn around and misuse that and misapply that by acting like everybody under the sun must follow those rules, like you said about Taco Bell earlier. So our our way that we handle that, it's a different kind of defense. Instead of saying there is no case when in a criminal case based on the fact that no authorized representative of a plaintiff came to the court with any primary pleadings, there's nothing. So instead of having that as a primary defense, when it's a code enforcement, code ordinance kind of a situation, then the main thing to be noticing and highlighting is that you are not one of the, quote, residents or the, the people to whom these ordinances apply. You know, all of the laws apply to you, of course. These guys are not authorized to create law. They can't legislate from their little mahogany room. They just can't. Well, look, uh, what, what would you say to wrap this up? And well, I'm going to give you the last word. What do you say? That's great. Yeah, we can. This is a good, a good place to draw the line, I think, for people to at least have bite size. Uh, here's, here are some things to think about, some things to prepare for, and, and ways to categorize our thoughts and feelings about when something happens to us, what do we do next? So, so I think that's a good starting point. Yes. And we can go into some more detail about the, the paperwork to generate. If you want to do that on another time, we can talk about in certain situations, here's what you actually need to go do to get yourself off the hook or to hold the wrongdoers accountable because they're going to generate a lot of wrongdoing 